right, so I am live with episode six of uh, 52 Weeks of AWS, and today I'm going to finish up the AWS Cloud Practitioner material. So this should be a good summary of the last sections of the exam, and this AWS Cloud Practitioner exam is something that I've taught students, maybe thousands of students all over the world, maybe more than that. Uh, this material and in, in general I would say it's it's great for people that are new to AWS and I would recommend starting with the cloud practitioner certification before I get to that what I will do is also show you a little bit of stuff I've been working on with AWS and after we get through the cloud practitioner material I'll probably maybe take a couple episodes and dive into some coding and multiple languages like Go or C Sharp or Swift, uh, Bash, and, and show some things. And then I'll go into the Solutions Architect certification after that. So the idea here with the podcast is to just really share what I'm working on each week and incrementally uh, let you level up. So maybe to start with, I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, here we go. Share the screen. And I'm going to go to a window that has uh, the some of the recent material that I've been working on. Uh, and in particular, one of the things I was working on this week is the .NET and AWS uh, ecosystem. And one of the things that I would recommend starting off with, no matter what language you're using, is to try to do things in the cloud shell first. And so I have an example here where I show some of the things that you can actually do from the cloud shell. And what's awesome about the cloud shell, and let me actually just put this to the side as well so I can follow along on my own. What's nice about the cloud shell is that it's probably the quickest way to play around with an API, it, much quicker than doing things with uh, another language. And I'll show you what I mean. So you see this example here, I can just copy it and I can go into a Cloud Shell, just click this button, you know, launch a Cloud Shell. Now it takes 30 seconds or so to, to spin it up, but really I've found it to be one of the best ways to explore uh, an API uh, before I get into Python or C Sharp or whatever, whatever language I'm using. And in particular, one of the things that I'll show you is if we go to Google here and we just type in AWS CLI, you can see that there's a whole list of uh, different things that you can do here. But in general, the the idea here is that there's a command uh, and then there's an option and then there's resource uh, identifiers. And in particular, here's a good example, you know, AWS EC2, you know, describe the instances or, you know, uh, publish a message. It, it really is the most efficient possible way to, to do anything in, in AWS. So, you know, if we go back here and just let this thing refresh, it should be ready to go. Uh, I can run a comprehend command. So the way I'm gonna run this command is I'm gonna start off with AWS, uh, do a, a sub command, which would be the name of the service. The comprehend service is the natural language processing uh, AI service. And then I'm gonna use a sub command, which allows me to run a component of that service. So. If I just paste in here, uh, AWS Comprehend Detect Sentiment, I, I like to do these uh, backslashes for each of the lines so that it's easy to read and share the code with other people. So when I do this, the AWS Cloud Shell will go through and it'll ask me what I wanna do uh, and I'll go ahead and paste this in. So once I throw this in here, it'll come back with a JSON payload that has the sentiment as the key and then the value of that sentiment as the as the value, and then sentiment score would be the key, and then it also contains a dictionary of the positive, negative, neutral, or mixed values. So very very easy to play around here. And if I do up arrow, I could you know change things around and say you know today is very chilly, but I love today or I don't know, something like this, and it says mixed, right? Uh, and so, you know, in, in general, the the idea here is that prototype things out using the uh, bash terminal. And, and in fact, I think one of the examples they showed 
which I can actually go to, is if we want to type in AWS EC2 describe instances, very straightforward, right? Like it, it, it just is, in my opinion, the most efficient possible way to do anything on AWS is to use the shell. So just kind of a pro tip there. So once I got that going, one of the things that I did, if I go back to this example, was that I did a sudo yum install links. And this is a, a pretty cool little uh, technique to be aware of, especially if you're into data science, is that links is a command line browser. And so I'm gonna go back to the, uh, the Cloud Shell environment here, and I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say uh, sudo yum install links. So let's go ahead and do that. And the reason I run sudo would be that it would uh, elevate the privileges. I would do install links with yum, and the yum is the package manager that works with the uh, Amazon Linux 2, which is what Cloud Shell is running. I'll say yes. There we go. And once I've got this installed, then if I go back to my instructions here, we can actually start to read other websites by running the links command and then dump. And this will actually just dump it out to the, the terminal. So in this case, I'm going to look at Albert Einstein. Uh, here we go. And we go through here. We say, great, Albert Einstein. And I just paste it out. And so if you're doing some data science and scraping, this might be one of the coolest ways to scrape with the Cloud Shell. And there, there we go. And I can you know look at things. Now, one thing to be aware of is that I could assign the output of this operation. Let's say if I use the head-c um, 5000, that would give me the first 5000 bytes, which conveniently is all that the command line tool from AWS Comprehend will take. So I, I dump that out to a variable. And then what I can do is I can actually um, paste this code into a whole uh, sentiment analysis detection. So if we go here, I can go through here and I can I can do sentiment analysis detection and it's gonna go through here and it's gonna say, there we go. The, it's a neutral score, but there is a, a lot of positive uh, weight here. So definitely try out doing some stuff with Bash, you know, and, and using things like links alongside Cloud Shell, great way to do things with AWS. And further, if you wanna do something really tricky, uh, I have an example here where I detect uh, entities and uh, I allow you to you know, go through here and, and build out a, a very sophisticated pipeline. In fact, let's just go ahead and run that. And so if we want to, I can just go to uh, this, this uh, snippet, paste it in, and I'll just walk you through what it does. So basically, I say AWS Comprehend Detect Entities. So grab the entities out of some payload. I say dash dash language English. I do text equals text. So that's that payload I pulled from links. And then I say I want to output the results of the extraction. And then I use a traditional bash pipeline here where I uh, cut the fifth field. Then I uh, go through here and I only grab the uh, alpha, alphabet uh, characters. And um, then I go through and I take the upper to lower. And then I, I get rid of new lines. I sort it. I do a unique. I then do a reverse sort, and then I look at just the first few uh, items. And what this gives me is that I now have the entities that are extracted, cleaned up, that are probably the most important for those 5,000 bytes that I had. So I can see, you know, Einstein, there's 12 of them, right? So if this, if I was just blindly, you know, scraping tons and tons of websites, uh, this would probably give me a very, very good idea of what this Wikipedia article was out about, right? Uh, well, it's about Einstein, right? So there's 12 instances in the first 5,000 bytes. There's um, uh, six instances of university. There's German, Empire, Albert, you know, so really, really neat uh, to, way to interactively do things from the command line. Okay, so that's probably a good enough uh, snippet of some of the things I'm working on, and you can go to this repo yourself, which is uh, no gift um, inside of GitHub and .NET AWS Comprehend. And you can even look at a C-sharp example I have here as well, where I go through and I build some stuff in C-sharp. But I'm gonna move on now to the final part of the Cloud Practitioner material. And what I'm gonna cover is starting um, 
We already covered, I believe, the seven, which is storage, last week. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do these last three modules, starting with uh, module eight here, which is databases. So let's go into this databases and uh, talk about how they work on the AWS platform. So to start with, uh, we're gonna talk about the RDS system, which I've used in production many times. DynamoDB I've used in production. Redshift, Aurora. Uh, and let's go ahead and dive right into it. So uh, Amazon has a relational database service called RDS. And uh, what it does is it allows you to forget about some things that are really annoying. And in, in particular, when you have to, when you have an unmanaged system, you have to scale the, the load yourself. You have to develop the fault tolerance system, like, you know, uh, client server relationships, horizontal scaling, you have to do backups. And I've been badly, badly burned in my life. Every time I've worked at organizations, even when I was in charge, I've still made mistakes when databases are unmanaged. I've had much more success with managed databases because they can do the scaling for you. In fact, with Amazon, I remember one time I was in the Bay Area and I walked up to the headquarters of an office and I literally clicked a button while I was inside of Amazon to upgrade my own database in production because it had problems. And it literally took two minutes and was like, poof, went to a, new, a, a bigger instance. So there's a lot to like about the RDS system. So the challenges of a relational database is the maintenance, energy footprint, software installation, packages, uh, database backups, HA or high availability. There's limits on scalability, right? Because eventually you'll run out of um, the ability to vertically scale it, data security, and then also the patching. It's very easy to get some security hole in the OS. With RDS, though, it, it manages the service for you and allows you to uh, address a lot of the challenges of an unmanaged standalone relational database. It allows you to focus on application. And so you can give the applications the performance, high availability, all the stuff that comes with RDS. So in the example from on-prem to uh, Amazon RDS here, you can see that they're on-prem. There's a lot of stuff you have to do that you really don't want to do. In fact, I, I've done many of these things in my life and it's it's actually very annoying. Uh, but when you go to EC2, um, you, really Amazon provides like patches, OS, rack and stack servers. But then when you go to RDS, what's nice about it is that because it's specifically designed the snapshotting gets taken care of. So I would say just snapshotting and scaling alone are, are, are you know some of the killer features, but it also has the ability to do high availability uh, deployments by using uh, multiple AZ-based RDS, which means that you can put these in different, different um, physical data centers so you don't have to worry about there being downtime. So manage responsibilities. This would be, um, you would manage things like the application and then the AWS manages the installation, pat patches, database software, uh, high availability, scaling, power, and racking, stacking, server maintenance. So I would find it very difficult for someone to justify at a more of like a Fortune 500 level managing their own da you know, database you would have to have a very good reason, in, in my opinion, just because of the advantages of using something like RDS. So in the case of RDS uh, database instance here, there's things like um, CPU memory network performance, and then the storage, you know, magnetic SSD, IOPS. In the old days before SSD was available, one of the biggest bottlenecks with databases was the spinning disk was really the kiss of death for, for database. And it's amazing how just moving to SSDs has really uh, dramatically improved the performance. So how would it work in a virtual private cloud? You would have a public subnet where your EC2 services would live and then the private subnet, so no one can access it. You don't want people talking to your database directly. That's a big no-no. Instead, you have the private subnet connected to the EC2 instance, and then when people access your uh, web service, they're never directly talking to the database. In an HA setup or high availability setup with multi AZ or multi availability zones, what happens is that you have the the RDS instance synchronized also to a private subnet, and this allows you to, you know, basically have this thing uh, on standby 
waiting for uh, an event where it needs to be triggered. Now, uh, another example here would be that you could also have things automatically fail and you know DNS could uh, you know, would not even need to be addressed uh, in, in this scenario. So one of the things that uh, you're able to do with RDS read replicas is that you can offer async replication and they can be promoted to primary if needed. So this is a, a very traditional uh, way to scale out uh, basically horizontally is that you have read replicas where all the read operations go to it. And what happens is uh, many times the, the bottleneck on, on a system is actually the read. I mean, sometimes it's a write, but in, in general, this allows you to uh, create the, the read replicas in a different region than the primary. And then this uh, really goes over things like disaster recovery, because if the primary goes down, you can just promote the read slave, you know, basically into the, 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 the system that you need. Okay, so you use cases here, there's web and mobile applications, this would be high throughput. Um, they have e commerce applications, that would be a low cost database, mobile online games. These are all examples of those. So when would you use an Amazon RDS system? Well, I would say complex transactions or complex queries, um, right? A, a medium to high query system. You know, you don't have more than a single worker node. You want high durability, but when would you not want to use RDS? So if you have massive read writes, so like 150,000 writes a second, I mean, that's a lot of writes. Uh, and you have sharding due to high data size. You have very simple operations, like you're just basically putting data in, pulling it out, uh, and that's more of a, a NoSQL um, use case, or if you have a bunch of uh, customization for your, your database. So the way it works with RDS is you build um, clock hour billing, um, and you also have to consider the characteristics, so engine size, memory, right? So do you wanna use MySQL, Postgres, you know, uh, SQL Server is another option from Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, what are the different purchase types here? You can do on demand, which is much more expensive. I think especially if, if I can think of one of the most common mistakes a company would make is to use the databases as on demand, because maybe for the first three months, as you're figuring out your capabilities and how much, you know, people are, are hitting your site, but really you should do a reserved instance for a relational database system because you should know what the characteristics are in terms of performance and you're paying much more money if you use on demand. Also in terms of storage, uh, you know, you, you have provision storage uh, and you also have the ability to, you know, have backup storage. <clears throat> uh, and in particular, one of the things you can do as well is you need to know about the input and output requests made to the database. And there's also storage and IO charges that are different depending on what kind of config. So if it's a single AZ, which is not recommended, um, you, you don't, there, there are not as many charges as a multi AZ. So the multi AZ, uh, you are charged um, basically because of the requests that are, that are being made. And so you should be aware of the, some of those additional charges, but for data transfer, there's no charges for inbound uh, and there's tiered charges for outbound. <clears throat> so we'll kind of skip through uh, some of this lab material, but you know, basically RDS is, a, is I think of great service for most corporations that are using uh, cloud computing and for startups. So DynamoDB, the idea here between uh, a relational or non-relational is does go back to something called the CAP theorem where you have a trade-off between uh, characteristics of a database like consistency or availability um, or partitionability. But in this particular example, they show that there's rows and columns in SQL, but non-relational is key value. So you can think of a no SQL database a lot like a giant um, JSON serving server, right? So you have key value pairs and you put the JSON inside and you pull the, the JSON out. So why would you want to use it? It's fast, flexible. I can't tell you how many startups I've worked at that have used either Mongo or DynamoDB. Key value, the reason people like it, it's just very easy to use, uh, unlimited storage, 
because it's a distributed database, low latency queries, scalable read writes. So some of the things to be aware of with Dynamo, tables, items, attributes are the core Dynamo compon components, and they support a couple different um, primary keys. There's partition key, uh, partition and key sort. And so as the, the data grows, the table is partitioned by key, and you can query the, the key to find uh, items, or you can even scan. So you can just scan the entire uh, database. You know, I don't think that's really something you would want to do at scale, but uh, in some situations, a scan is actually a, a reasonable thing to do. So items in a, in a table must have a key, and that's really the secret sauce for a key value database. It can either be a single key or a compound key, and so the compound key would have a partition key and a sort key, for example, and attributes. <clears throat> and so in, in terms of DynamoDB, in fact, I'll just show you real quick, um, since I already have AWS open here, that it's surprisingly simple to use DynamoDB. To, to use it, you just click on it, and it's almost like Google Sheets or something, in my opinion. You go to tables, and you just click on create table, and we just say, you know, 52 weeks, like this, and we just need to put in some kind of partition key. I like to say, I don't know, globally unique ID, right? That's one way we could do this and just click create, that's it, right? So it's really just a couple clicks of a button and then you have you know, a database that's, that's gonna be created for you. And it's actually very quick even to, it's, it's actually, I think, creating a table, you can see how quick it is, it's, it's like 10 seconds. And once you've got this set up, all you need to do is you can actually go through here and create an item. And then in, in the item, we can just say like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, and there we go, right? And, and basically because it a globally unique ID, uh, you, you know, is the key, we would just put in you know, a bunch of globally unique IDs and then we could populate it and then, and then do whatever we wanted to it. So very, very straightforward to build things using the uh, DynamoDB interface. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about Redshift. Redshift is definitely a different beast. Um, one of the things that's that's interesting about it is it's a data warehouse, so columnar store, and in particular, uh, if you need the heavy lifting of doing things in a data warehouse, uh, it can be very cost effective, um, and so it has the ability to do scalability automatically as well, uh, and with Redshift, it has connections to many different SQL clients and BI tools. Uh, so that's one nice thing about it. So it's really an enterprise data warehouse. Uh, and so it's low price for small customers and you can scale it up uh, as needed. And it's also uh, another use case for it could be like a SaaS if you wanted to scale a data warehouse, uh, add analytics function, right? It would be pretty straightforward to do that with Redshift. Okay, Aurora is um, kind of builds on top of RDS and it's a uh, enterprise class relational database and it, and it enhances some of these open source tools like MySQL or Postgres. It automates uh, things like um, backups, provisioning. Uh, and so the benefits of Aurora are it's a managed service. It's fast, available, simple, pay as you go, compatible. So it's really like a, a kind of a jazzed up uh, RDS. And so with the uh, Aurora system, you can do things like have 15 read replicas, which is pretty amazing actually, because it, it extends what a, a traditional MySQL Postgres database can do. And so it's got resilient uh, design as well. So it doesn't need to have, um, you know, basically checkpoints. It's, it's already done this automatically for you. Uh, so basically it's a high performance system, high availability, multiple layers of, of security, but it fits, in with the MySQL or Postgres, um, you know, compatibility, and it's fully managed. So, when would you want to use the the what tool for for what job? So, enterprise relational database use RDS. For fast, flexible NoSQL, use Amazon uh, DynamoDB. For operating system access or application features that aren't supported by AWS, like you have a custom database you need to manage, you can just set that up on EC2 or if you have a specific case-driven requirement like ML or data warehouse or graphs like you know, 
the, the graph databases are something I've used in production. You could use an AWS purpose-built database service. So there are additional uh, databases on AWS like their graph database, for example. <clears throat> so I think this is probably a good place to uh, move on to the next section. And I'm gonna talk about in section nine here, uh, cloud architecture. So we're really getting to uh, the end of, um, of the cloud practitioner material. And so what we're gonna talk about is the well-architected framework. And in particular, the well-architected framework is something that you'll see a lot you know, in documentation about consulting or whatever. And the idea is that there's a essentially like a checklist, right? Where you're you're telling people what it is you, you, that that you you want to build, and and you make sure that they're doing it in a in a correct way. And so one example they're bringing up is it would be a lot like building architecture. So what is it? It's a guide for securing and de, I'm sorry for designing infrastructures that are secure, high performant, resilient, and efficient. And it's a consistent approach. So it's not like somebody has a different opinion each time. And it's a way to provide best practices that were developed through the lessons learned from reviewing other people's architecture. So I, I think this is a very good idea, is to have a checklist where you have standards of excellence. So what are the pillars of the AWS well architected framework? We have operational excellence, we have security, reliability, performance, cost optimization. And so let's go through here and uh, take a look at some of these. Uh, identity and access management. This would be how to manage credentials and authentication. One of the biggest, uh, I would say problems with people uh, setting up AWS is that their API keys get uh, put somewhere, like the root keys get put into GitHub and then someone takes over the account. Very, very common problem. Uh, other things like password requirements, credential, uh, credential rotation, uh, MFA or multi-factor authentication. These would all be things that you could go through with a uh, well-architected framework and address. So, you know, they go through here and talk about some of these uh, companies that, that you could actually go through. I can let you go through that on your own. Now, in terms of operational excellence pillar, uh, this would be how to run and monitor systems uh, and make sure that they're, they're, they're actually serving the requirements for your organization. So what are the key topics? Uh, automating changes, responding to events, defining standards to manage daily operations. And so some of the design principles include uh, perform operations as code, make frequent, small, reversible changes, refine operations procedures frequently, anticipate failure, and also learn from uh, events and failure. So, I think this is something I've seen in the real world quite a bit is that you need to figure out why things are failing and actually improve things. So this is the concept of Kaizen, uh, which you'll hear a lot in DevOps, is continually make things better. So you need to monitor what's happening to identify how you can make things better. And then in terms of operational excellence, we can look at you know how do you determine what your priorities are? How do you structure your organization to support business outcomes? Um, how do you design your workload so you can understand its state? How do you understand the health of your workload? You know, how do you evolve your operations? All, all really good questions to consider. <clears throat> okay, security. Uh, you know, one of the most important ones of any system. You know, how do you protect information systems and assets? Um, how do you protect com confidentiality and integrity of data? Identify who is doing what. Protect your systems. Uh, establish controls to detect security events. So, you know, this means implementing a strong identity foundation, traceability, security at all layers, automate security best practices, protect data in transit and, and at rest, keep people away from the data, and then prepare for security events. So a few questions in security, with, you know, that you could ask an organization is how do you securely operate your workload? How do you manage the identities of people and machines? Um, how do you detect and investigate security events? I mean, that's a that's a pretty basic one. There is that if you ask an organization, how do you detect uh, you know breaches in your organization, and and they say what, what's that? Well, that's a bad sign, right? Because you, you can have a lot of issues that are that are happening. Now, uh, how do you protect your network resources? How do you protect your compute resources? How do you classify your data? These are all really important things to 
to be aware of. Okay, uh, reliability. Uh, this is making sure that your workload performs its intended function and consistently, right? So if your system isn't functioning because there are scale issues or there's um, software deployment issues, you're, you don't have a reliability. And, and so you need to design your system. So you need to be able to design your system to recover from failure automatically. And this would be, uh, for example, a load balancer. That's one of the core features of it is that it can detect a health event and take that instance out and put another one in. Uh, also recovery procedures, how to scale horizontally, right? For, this is a, a very common problem is someone sets up AWS and they don't have a auto scale group set up. So the machines can't scale, even though it's fairly simple to do. Uh, and so this means stop guessing, capacity, manage change and automation. Reliability questions, you know, how do you manage the service quotas? You know, how do you design your workload? Um, service architecture, how do you monitor what's going on? Uh, a failure, there's a, a, a big one, is how do you back up your data? How do you test that the, the backup is actually working? Uh, how do you plan for disaster recovery? In my opinion, if you care about backing up your data and you don't test or store on you know a periodic basis, you're just asking for, for problems. And I've had this happen in, in real life as well. So performance, uh, basically use IT and compute resources efficiency, efficiently. So you don't want to be spending $100,000 a month on Amazon when it could be done in 1000 right? That would be wasting your company's resources. Um, and so this would mean dem democratize advanced technologies, go global in minutes. So you don't need to be managing your own global data centers. You can just use the global data centers that are available in AWS. Also, serverless can be a huge win. I'm a huge fan of serverless because it makes things, in many cases, more efficient to, to build solutions, experiment more often, and um, consider mechanical sympathy. So what that means is use technology that aligns best with what you're trying to achieve. So what are some of the performance efficiency questions? You know, How do you select the best architecture? How do you review the best architecture? And also, um, you know, how do you monitor resources to ensure they're performing? And how do you use trade-offs to, to improve the performance? Cost op optimization, so avoiding unnecessary costs, key one. You know, uh, make sure you have a, a consumption model, which is you pay for the resources that you require. You have uh, ability to measure the efficiency, so the, you're measuring the business output of the workload and the costs that are associated with it, you're, you're stop, you stop spending money on undifferentiated heavy lifting. So basically, if you're doing stuff that you don't need to do, just stop spending on it, money on it, for example, managing your own data center, and then analyze it and attribute expenditure. So see who is generating the expenses so you can figure out if it's actually required or not. Some of the questions, you know, how do you evaluate costs when you select services? You know, how do you evaluate new services? These are all great questions to, to ask your organization. And when a system, a company's on AWS and they're spending a lot of money, this is a great series of questions to ask them. And it's surprising, right, that how many organizations or in startups in particular don't ask these questions. All right, so really in a nutshell, AWS War Architected Tool, it helps you re review the state of your workload and compare them with the latest uh, architectural practices, gives you access to knowledge, delivers an action plan with step-by-step uh, -step guidance, and provides a consistent process for you to review. So a lot of uh, great things about that. And now in terms of uh, reliability and availability, uh, there's a great quote by the CTO of Amazon, Werner Vogels, everything fails all the time. Yeah, I think that is a, pretty much the way things work. And you need to assume that that's gonna happen, right? And so what is reliability? It's a measure of your system's ability to provide functionality when desired by the user. And this means everything. So, you know, hardware, or firmware, software, and then what's the probability the system will function? And what's the mean time between failures or MTBF, total time in service divided by the number of failures? So you can see this with a car, right? There's brakes, ignition, cooling, that's the system. So understanding reliability metrics, a system's brought online, you know, what's the mean time between failures, mean time to repair, 
these are all important things to be aware of. And so normal operating time, a percentage of uptime, for example, 99.9 .9 would mean uh, you know overtime for one year. Number of nines, five nines means 99.999% available. So uh, high availability, this is when a system can withstand some measure of degradation. Uh, and also downtime is minimized and there's minimal human in intervention. So you can't call yourself highly available if humans are clicking buttons, right? That's, that's a, if it basically should be minimal, minimal, if any, for a high available system. The availability tiers, you'll see this a lot with SLAs, service level agreements, that um, if it's 99% available, it means that it may go out for three days uh, per year. And that may be okay for things like batch processing, um, but if it's an internal tool, maybe you're okay with it being down only about like eight hours a year, like, I don't know, project management tool. Uh, you can say, you know, um, point of sale system, maybe it's down four hours uh, per year, so it'd be 99.95. There would be a, a video system, like a, a streaming service, maybe that would be 99.99, so 52 minutes a year. And then if it's an ATM or telecommunications, it might be five minutes per year. So that would be 99.999%. So it's important to know about the nines. Factors that, in, in, that influence the availability would be fault tolerance. So you know, do you have the redundancy built in, scalability, recover, recoverability? Uh, and then there's also this trusted advisor. It is actually a very good idea if you're using AWS to look at this periodically. It tells you things like cost, performance, security, uh, fault tolerance, uh, service limits, and, and these will actually give you some uh, pointers on like things to fix. So yeah, why not why not take a look at it? All right, so that uh, takes us uh, through the architecture. The last one that I'm going to cover for today and then we'll have cloud practitioner wrapped up and I'll move on to other things next week is automating scaling and monitoring. So let's go through here and just talk about it real quick. So uh, what we're gonna talk about here is uh, things like load balancing, which I think is very confusing to many people. Like, hey, what is, what is load balancing? In a nutshell, it's designing for failure. And so the idea is that you distribute the traffic across multiple machines so that you, because again, you're assuming things will fail or that needs to be scaled up. And so, um, you know, there's types of load balancers. There's an application uh, load balancer, and this would be HTTP or HTTPS. That's like web traffic, either unencrypted or encrypted. And this is operating at OSI model layer seven. We covered that earlier, the network um, OSI model layers. There's network load balancer. This would be TCP, UDP, TLS traffic. So you, you hear about these different um, network level uh, protocols. TCP is the one that most people use, and, and it's got this exponential back off into it where if the traffic starts slowing down, then the, the sender will start s slowing down the amount of traffic. UDP is like fire and forget. So basically you just fire as much as you want. So UDP can be faster, and that's why some game companies will use the UDP protocol, and that operates at uh, layer four. The previous generation is called Classic, and that would be HTTP, HTTPS, TCP, and SSL, and that operates at both application and transport layer. So it is important to know the names of these load balancers for certification exams and then what, what they actually do. So how does load balancing work? With an application load balancer, basically it can register targets in a target group, and then it can figure out whether the machines that are serving out the traffic are healthy. If they're healthy, it'll serve out the load. So elastic load balancing use cases would be highly available in fault tolerant applications, containerized environments, and also elasticity and scalability, so invoking a Lambda function over HTTPS. Um, and so let's move on now to um, load balancer monitoring. So how do you know what's happening in a load balancer? So Amazon CloudWatch metrics are used to verify the systems is performing. Um, access logs, so you can also go through here and just see what's actually happening. And then CloudTrail, and this captures like who is going into the API interactions, and this is really like a security auditing uh, approach. 
Now, CloudWatch uh, is the monitoring service that you can interact with. And uh, in particular, what it does is it monitors AWS resources like EC2, for example, or S3, also applications that run on AWS. It can collect both standard metrics like CPU memory and also custom metrics. It can send alarms. So this would be something common. Maybe you're having performance issues or, or CPU you know, is starting to spike. You could have some kind of a notification sent and maybe go, go, it can go to your phone or it could go to an email. And then you have events. This is rules that match changes. So what are the alarms? Uh, this is, again, very straightforward thing that uh, I think is recommended is to create an alarm based on some, you know, either static threshold, anomaly detection, or, or a, a metric math expression. Um, and, and you can do anything from namespace metrics, statistic period. So probably the simplest thing to think about would be, you know, if the CPU is over 75% for five minutes, you know, do something, right? Send a, send a notification. And in fact, that's one of the examples they give. If average CPU utilization is 60% for five minutes, you know, or if the number of simultaneous connections to a database is over 10 for a minute, do something, right? These are all the kind of things that you would do with CloudWatch alarms. So what about EC2 auto scaling? You know, why is it so important? The idea here is that you don't want to overscale something at the beginning because you're gonna pay for things you don't need. And in the case of auto scaling, it helps you maintain the availability. It also al allows you to automatically add and remove instances. It detects that when there's a problem, like you know, randomly things can, can go wrong, even on just one host. And so this provides uh, different options like manual, scheduled, dynamic, or on demand, or predictive scaling. <clears throat> So typical traffic at a place like Amazon <coughs> could be things like, you know, it's pe peaks up and down. And so the provisioned capacity would be wasted, right? Instead, uh, it would be better to actually, you know, match what's happening automatically. And you could do this with uh, like an auto scaling group that collects the instances and treats them as a logical group. And you would have a minimum size and desired capacity, and you launch the extra ones when you need them, and then you scale them back out when you don't. And so you have scaling out versus scaling in. So you have a base config, maybe a couple instances. To scale out, you would launch, let's say, another node, and you have three virtual machines running to scale back in. This would just terminate that instance and come back. So that is the that is the ideal scenario, is that your system is is able to actually scale up and down without humans uh, being there. If you don't have this, you you have a poor AWS architecture. So how does uh, EC2 auto scaling work? You have a launch config, AMI instance type, role, security group, EBS, and you go through and you do health checks. And typically that's the typical way you do it. And you could actually dynamically scale up and down. I think that's probably also the most typical way. So dynamic scaling, one, an easy one would be you would just put on this auto scaling group. If average CPU is over 60% for five minutes, you know, add another node. So AWS auto scaling will mo monitor your application and automatically adjust capacity. And, and it will provide a simple interface for it. So it works with EC2, um, container service, DynamoDB, Aurora, uh, and in general, the, the scenario here is that you you don't need to build out this stuff yourself. You know, you, you can actually uh, try that out. So, you know, in a nutshell, I, I guess the main thing I'll, 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 I'll stop with is, is that, you know, in when you're building things out with AWS, um, uh, what's what's important to be aware of is that probably one of the easiest things to mess up is that you have to manually go through and and do things with humans and if you have humans clicking buttons you're setting yourself up for failure i think that's probably the biggest takeaway that i would recommend and, and somebody in a question here said i love what you're doing when you're answering questions could you please answer if i should be doing projects along with videos yeah i would say in general with um with things like learning to do cloud computing, the more projects you can do, the better. And in particular, 
it's just a habit to get into is like building solutions with AWS. Um, I would I would say any of the labs that you can get access to, build them, try different services, use a cloud shell. The more um, abilities you have to to play around with things, I think the the better you're going to get at cloud computing. So, just to kind of wrap up everything I've covered the last few weeks with AWS um, Cloud Practitioner certification, is that you know going through taking their the practice practice exam, making sure that you have a, a notepad or like a Google Doc or a Word Doc or whatever that you write down everything that appears in the white papers that they recommend. Like if you see a term that you don't know about, like application load balancer, I would put it into a document, look up the definition for it, write it down. And if you just do that alone as a way to study for the exam, that's probably one of the most effective techniques is make sure you understand the terminology write it down and then you're going to you're going to be able to to master that terminology you won't feel confused when you're on the exam second i would say is that build out these projects many as many projects as you can that are related to the exam you're studying it's just going to help you understand uh, what that service is going to do okay well that's a probably a good time to uh, kick off for the day and then next week i'm going to cover a little bit more into to application development, probably take a break for a couple weeks before we go into the Solutions Architect exam. But uh, I will see you all next week at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. All right, talk to you later. Bye.